Hello and thank you for participating in the TDJ Group's webinar on Foundry and Fixed Facility Stabilization. My name is Chris Scott and I'm the Foundry Account Manager and Technical Sales Rep here at the TDJ Group Incorporated. TDJ is a manufacturer of heavy metal stabilization chemistries that are used in several industries including metal casting, soil remediation, and lead paint abatement. Uh, purpose uh, today is to briefly answer what is stabilization, why would we stabilize, and how we go about stabilizing. Just as a quick reference point for everybody out there right now, uh, there uh, you are, I believe, muted. So if you're shuffling papers or have anything happening at your desk that should not come through in the uh, presentation here. Um, and also on the uh, top right, uh, there are some uh, dialogue uh, boxes up there and you can ask either a private or a public question if anything comes up and during the uh, uh, presentation, uh, we'd be happy to answer, it, answer that either during or at the end of the presentation. Uh, I believe if you uh, ask, there's a public one that'll be for everybody to see. Private one would be something if you want to ask a question that might be something you don't want everybody to take a look. So with that, we'll uh, dive right in. Obviously, what is stabilization? Rendering a hazardous material non-hazardous, uh, typically for disposal. Uh, there's a you can chemically convert to a non-hazardous form, or there's also a chemical or physical physically modifying that. Uh, either uh, a lot of times, what that might entail is uh, people add cement and solidify a hazardous waste if it's not necessarily just a chemical conversion. Um, what the EPA restricts is the leachable heavy metals. Totals are not regulated federally. Um, it's just a leachable lead, which they don't want the, the heavy metals to leach in their soil and, and then obviously into the groundwater and poison that. Uh, why stabilize? Uh, hazardous waste disposal is obviously very expensive. We've seen it over $300 per ton just for the tip fees for hazardous waste disposal. You get a lot of reporting requirements for state and local and transportation. Uh, obviously, there are not a lot of hazardous waste permitted landfills in the country, particularly compared to uh, local landfills or industrial landfills. So a lot, oftentimes with uh, hazardous waste disposal, it's not just the cost of the, of the tip fee, but transportation for uh, several hundred miles can be a lot more expensive, obviously, than local. Non-hazardous disposal we've seen is typically around $30 to $40 per ton. You obviously don't have the reporting requirements that you do with the uh, uh, hazardous waste disposal, and it's local, so you have less of a transportation issue, of course. Who needs stabilization? Um, obviously, metal casting foundries. Uh, foundries is who we're kind of looking at today. Um, specifically, smelters are another one, soil remediation, brownfield, super fun sites, old mills, uh, rail yards, things like that. Uh, wire chop is one that we've uh, come across where, interestingly enough, the uh, casings on the wire, the plastic casing oftentimes will contain uh, heavy metals. I, I don't know if that was foreign made wire or whatever, but uh, we've uh, worked a lot with some wire chop operations, and obviously lead paint abatement is another one that we work with. Uh, waste streams that are typically in need of stabilization uh, with foundries, smelters, and fixed facilities. Dust collection is a big one, bag house dust um, coming off of uh, the exhaust gases uh, that come off of the uh, melting process. Um, uh, typically has a lot of uh, particulate that has heavy metals, lead, cadmium, chromium, things of that nature into it. it gets brought into a bag house where the particulate is separated from the air um, and the particulate is what you're obviously stabilizing. Uh, sand systems are another one, lead, lead brass uh, foundries that make, um, you know, brass castings for valves and things of, of that nature, a lot of times the lead will be get permeated into the sand itself and they'll have sand systems to uh, siphon off the really fine material that, that um, is not uh, good for the casting uh, sands themselves. 
and that'll be another opportunity there as far as uh, a waste stream that would need to be stabilized. Soils and heavy metal laden waste piles, old industrial sites, rail yards, slag piles, things of that nature, all things that we've seen. Wire chop again is one that we've uh, we've looked at. Um, the bag house dust, I mean, is a pretty straightforward process. It's all the particulate matter that comes from a furnace melting process. Uh, this is the uh, particulate that's conveyed from the melting process into the bag house, which is a large filter, basically to protect uh, the environment from all that particulate being expelled out into the atmosphere. The uh, bag house collects all that dust, keeps it contained within the the bag house itself and allows the air uh, to be ventilated out, the clean air to be ventilated out of the bag house. Uh, the filters in the bag house are obviously collecting the particulate. Um, they allow the filtered air to be, uh, to obviously go back into the atmosphere. Regulated heavy metals are also present in the dust particulate. Typically it's lead, cadmium, chromium, things of that nature. Uh, the recreate metals that are regulated are uh, arsenic, silver, barium, cadmium, chromium, mercury, lead, and selenium. What is baghouse dust? The, this is a, a pretty good graphic from our uh, literature that has a uh, what a baghouse module would look at, would look like. Um, you can see here the dirty area from from the uh, furnace uh, or whatever operation might be there would pump all the, the air with the particulate matter into the bag house, which gets filtered through the bags and then gets pushed out the top. The clean air minus all the particulate matter gets pulled out. The bags are then periodically pulsed, pulse jets or, uh, or shaken, and the dust falls down to be collected in the bottom of the bag house where that gets released then into containers such as super sacks or roll-offs or things of that nature. Uh, heavy metals are, are an issue, uh, obviously, because the lead and cadmium are toxic and they can cause health issues and contaminate the water table if not stabilized. Um, a good example of that is uh, obviously people have heard about what happened over in Michigan. Uh, last uh, couple of years, Flint, Michigan had a lot of issues, and now it sounds like Detroit is starting to have some of those same issues right now with the, uh, with the lead-contaminated water that's uh, a toxic uh, material that can affect the nervous system in humans. So uh, it's regulated by the EPA. The uh, EPA regulates the leachability of these metals, not necessarily the totals, as we mentioned earlier, but just making sure that it's not going to leach into the groundwater. Uh, so the stabilization aspect of this, you know, obviously you, you've got a dust that you're generating. It has heavy metal contamination in it. How do we do that? If you want to stabilize it, isn't there a question about that being regulated? I mean, is it treatment? What's the difference between treatment and stabilization? Waste treatment is anything that's added to a waste after it's generated. Stabilization takes place before the generation. It's more of a process modification, and that is not regulated. Um, uh, when is a waste a waste is sort of the big uh, question mark there. And uh, we uh, uh, had contacted EPA back in 1995 to get clarification on that. This is a letter that James Lively for the TJ group had sent into the EPA to get clarification on point of generation so we can have an idea of when a waste is a waste so we know uh, where uh, we need to be concerned about the application of the stabilization materials. These are the, are the relevant uh, uh, quotes from that letter. Point of generation is correct that in general material is not considered a solid waste that was collected in the bag house. Determining the applicability of record would generally be made when the material is removed from the bag house. So basically the material is a waste once it leaves the bag house. So anything upstream from that would be considered process modification, not treatment. Uh, the generation, when it's obvious, is when it's when the dust is removed, anything up, upstream. I basically just said this. However, one of the kind of caveats to this is there are some industries 
where their dust is considered hazardous by process and nothing they change in the process will allow them to stabilize the material. The steel industry is, is one of these. There's a differentiation between the steel industry and the, uh, the foundry industry and in that uh, steel industry, their dust, uh, whether it be wet or dry, is uh, considered hazardous by process. Treatment versus process modification. Obviously, post-generation activity being treatment requires generation generator registration and notification. You have to have an EPA generator ID number. You have to have a lot of record keeping and reporting. You have to report to the record biennial report to let them know how much of each hazardous waste or whatever hazardous waste you generated, total amount of materials and so forth. That's published. It's public record at that point. Uh, there are storage requirements for, for um, uh, hazardous materials that you're going to be treating. You can only have it on site within 90 days. So a waste treatment uh, uh, has to be done either at a permanent facility or you have to have a permit for doing that on site. Obviously, when you do the pre-generation, the process modification, that eliminates all of those requirements and makes your life a lot more simple. Point of generation we talked about with the with our materials or with any kind of stabilization component in the foundry type industry, you would inject the material into the ductwork. Obviously, temperature can play a part with some materials. TDJ materials, we've had people inject the material at the charge door. So even at a couple thousand degrees, it doesn't affect the stabilization aspect of our material. It's uh, perfectly fine. It still mixes and trains very well with the dust. But as long as it's injected into the ductwork, that allows the material to... Uh, be entrained within the dust itself and stabilize the dust as it comes out. The injection aspect, obviously you have to have some equipment to inject the uh, material within the, within the duct, upstream of the bag house, and uh, you want to make sure that it's taken care of prior to the generation so it's a non-hazardous material. One kind of quick point to make about the chemistries themselves, we, we would pro probably go into this a little bit more in another type of webinar. We're just kind of hitting on the, uh, the stabilization itself here, but um, masking is an issue. There are several materials out there. Basically, lead and cadmium are amphoteric, which basically means that it leaches at very high and very low pHs. If you can stabilize it within the non-soluble range on the pH, a meter uh, or on the pH scale, you can fool the TCLP test. The TCLP test, there uh, again, it's you're testing the leachate, not the actual sample itself for the total for the amount of lead or cadmium. So they take the sample, they put it in with about a liter of a acid solution. It's tumbled for 19 hours overnight, and then the leachate itself is tested for what the lead content, cadmium content, content, whatever that metal they're testing for would be. So if you have a buffering product added to the sample, such as a reagent of some kind that is strictly a buffering, like calcium oxide or lime, uh, mag oxide would be, would be typical uh, buffers, you can pass that TCLP. However, that's a temporary reaction. It is not a long-term solution to that material. Uh, when that material it might pass TCLP test, you throw it into a landfill, and it was non-hazardous when you put it there, but it's like adding a, uh, you know, taking a Tums when you have heartburn or something. If nothing else changes, that Tums is going to uh, eventually wear off, and that solution will, the acid will come back out. So that material being in the landfill, eventually all those heavy metals will be available to leach once that uh, buffering is gone. So that's sort of a masking uh, thing. We mentioned here the impermissible dilution rule. Uh, generally, it was thought a long time ago that adding iron to uh, a foundry waste was uh, a good way to, to uh, render the material non-leachable, and it does work. The issue is, is that it's a plating process. So you add iron to a foundry dust, it will um, render the material non-leachable for TCLP. But once that material goes into a landfill, 
iron gets exposed to water and oxygen, it starts to oxidize. It starts to rust. All of that heavy metal that was plated onto that iron is now available to leach. There was a uh, large landfill down in Texas that the uh, company had a very big problem uh, having to dig everything out once they uh, figured out that was the issue they were having. So that was actually a big enough problem that the EPA actually decided to make a rule that it's impermissible dilution to add iron to a material. Regulatory framework, if this is anything somebody's interested in looking up, I mean, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act of 1976, RECRA, is one of the big ones that lists all the metals and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of information on testing and so forth. Comprehensive environmental response, composition, and liability act. That's the CERCLA, a lot of that on the uh, Superfund sites and so forth. Land disposal restrictions on what you can put in and so forth. Universal treatment standards on here as well as if you have a material that's like when you generate a hazardous waste, it's been characterized as a hazardous waste once it comes out of the bag house. You want to say you want to treat that and get it below. Well, at that point, you're no longer just getting into the regulatory limit. Universal treatment standards is now the level you have to achieve. So, for example, if you have lead in that material that you want to treat uh, rather than have stabilized it beforehand, the regulatory limit for lead is 5 milligrams per liter. The UTS value is 0.75 milligrams per liter. So it's uh, about uh, eight times less than what the regulatory. So you're, it's a much more stringent standard to meet. Reagent injection equipment, obviously, if you're going to add material upstream, you have to have a method of doing that. There are lots of different means of doing that. The simplest is just a, uh, a feeder uh, system that uh, that's, consists of a feeder, a hopper. You might need a blower. A lot of the systems nowadays, the bag house fans have enough draw that you might not need to have a blower. It would be enough to pull the material uh, from the feeder through through the piping up into the ductwork, uh, but you'd have to determine that by looking at the uh, calculations for what the draw is on that system itself and how far it has to go. Um, we can help with that if that is something you're looking at doing. Uh, determining the feeder size, the most important part is quantifying the dust generation. So you want to be able to break down how much dust is being generated in your process uh, over a fixed period of time. So, and you want to get an average. So going over, you know, a shorter period and then adding it into longer times, uh, you want to be able to get an idea. Basically, if you know that you produced X amount of dust over the course of uh, a week and you actually melted for X amount of time, you can work it out to a pounds per hour of dust generated within your system. Um, and when you're doing a treatability analysis with whatever reagent you're looking to used to stabilize the material, you basically work out a percent of the actual total material. So if you are producing 100 pounds per hour of dust and you know that a 5% or 10% add rate is going to be sufficient to stabilize the material, then obviously you look between somewhere between a 5 and a 10 pound per hour add rate in order to, to get to that percentage that you worked out with the treatability study. Um, feed rates will also dictate the most efficient product packaging system that's going to be trying to feed, you know, 300 to 500 pounds an hour. A bulk system is going to be most important for something like that. Having a silo uh, that will have a continuous feed of material as needed would be important for something like that. So you've got, you know, a bulk pneumatic tanker delivering 25 tons at a crack in order to get that material on hand. Uh, smaller systems, somewhere around 100 pounds an hour, bulk bags would be uh, really efficient for something like that. You don't have to change the bags quite as often as you would with a much larger system. And systems where you're feeding a very small amount of material, you know, maybe a couple of pounds an hour, you know, a smaller feeder that would only feed that would only need maybe something like 50 or 70 pound bags, but a couple of them. I've got some pictures here in the next couple of slides to give you an idea what that looks like. Here's a couple of pictures. The one on the left is a uh, is a bulk bag. These are both bulk bag feeder feeder units. 
the one on the left, uh, you can see the bulk bag at the top of it. There's actually on that, there's pneumatic arms that go up and kind of knead the bag. They keep the bag flowing sometimes when a bag is just hung there and there's no vibration or anything that's hitting the bag, the material can bridge. This system is, uh, has got a lot of bells and whistles that allow that the material to keep a constant flow. Uh, obviously, that's flowing from the bag into that hopper. That hopper then next down into the feeder itself, which is basically an auger running through the center of that. There, I believe this system actually has paddles that are needing a, uh, a live bottom hopper in the feeder itself to keep the material around the auger at all times so that as it feeds, it's feeding a consistent amount, which is one of the important things with these feeders is, is consistent feed. So you want to keep consistent head pressure, consistent uh, material filling the, the feeder itself. The idea is that, you know, if you keep that feeder filled same amount of material all the time as that auger feeds out, it's always going to be feeding the same amount of material. So this can be done with a lot of different methods as far as vibrators, you know, you can have air bladders, things of that nature, uh, that uh, both on the hoppers themselves and on the actual bag rack itself to keep the material flowing. System on the right is, is a much larger system. They have actually have a two feeder system, so if they need to shut the feeder down for any kind of maintenance, they can switch over to the others. Or if they wanted to run either two bags and just switch from one to the other, they can do that. Or if they ever have a second material that they want to add within the bag house, some places acid gases are more important. They have materials that they'll feed for that, uh, such as sodium bicarb and things of that nature. This is the smaller feeder I was kind of talking about earlier. You can tell that this is much smaller than the other two. This is a feeder that would feed, you know, anywhere from like a half a pound to maybe five pounds an hour. That hopper above there can probably hold a couple of 50 pound bags in there. You know, when you have a small amount of, of material that needs to be added uh, over the course of, uh, of time, this would be a much more uh, efficient method. I don't have a picture of a silo system on here, but typically it'd be the larger feeder it's just a larger uh, vision of this with a silo over the top rather than a super sack. So just to kind of sum up what we talked about here, I mean, a stabilization can obviously dramatically save over hazardous waste disposal. You're talking about $300 a ton pit fees versus $40 a ton, plus transportation costs are going to be much higher with a hazardous waste material than they would with a stabilized product. TDJ Group is a manufacturer of complex calcium silicate chemistries, uh, which are used for heavy metal stabilization. There are other products out there that use phosphates and sulfates and things like that. We're a silicate company. Uh, our material has been used for quite a while. We currently serve uh, more than 50 foundries and fixed facilities across the country. Uh, we are also very large in the soil remediation, and uh, we're actually, we've been called the Kleenex of the industry in the lead paint abatement markets with our product called Blastox. We do offer free treatability analyses and cost comparisons, if that's something you're, inter you're interested in. And uh, that's pretty much what I had for you today. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those now. If anybody would, have, would like to contact me after the fact, um, I'm happy to, to help you in any way we can. Again, we offer free treatability analyses and cost comparisons, so Again, I appreciate all of your time today, and I hope this presentation was helpful. We hope to do more in the future, uh, some on testing, uh, treatability studies, and things of that nature would be things we'd be looking at. If there's something you'd be interested in, please let us know. Thanks.